Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 226 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. What do we mean by the state? How is a state produced? Is the state something that everyone can participate in producing? Today, we're going to explore answers to these questions by investigating the creation of the state of South Carolina and the ways in which enslaved African Americans helped to build it. Ryan Katana, an associate professor of history at Wellesley College and the author of Making a Slave State, Political Development in Early South Carolina, will serve as our guide for this exploration. Now, as we venture into the early Palmetto State, Ryan reveals what we mean by space and how space relates to the study of history, the ways in which Black Carolinians helped to secure South Carolina's independence, and how enslaved men and women built the state of South Carolina and used its spaces for their own ends. But first, have you downloaded the free OI Reader app yet? Next week, we're going to have a very interesting episode. It's about the history of copyright and fair use. And our guest, Kyle Courtney, has commissioned some really great graphic comics about that history. So if you haven't yet downloaded the free OI Reader app, now is as good a time as any to click on over to your favorite app store and download it. Okay, are you ready to head back to early South Carolina? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of history at Wellesley College. He's a scholar of race, slavery, and space in the late colonial and early national eras. Today, he joins us to share details from his book, Making a Slave State, Political Development in Early South Carolina. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Ryan Katana. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of the show, and I'm really flattered to be here. That's really awesome, Ryan. Thanks so much for listening. Now, in Making a Slave State, Ryan seeks to uncover the relationship between state development and slavery. And to do this, he explores the important role that enslaved people played in the production of South Carolina's state spaces, governing policies, and practices. Now, Ryan, space is crucial to your study, so I wonder if you would tell us how you came to study the relationship between space and slavery and what exactly you mean by space. Okay. I guess I can sort of take you on a long journey of my graduate studies, but I won't bore you with that, except to say that I was really fortunate in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin to work with a historian of cartography, Tong Chai Wenichakul, whose book Siam Mapped is still a really influential book in the history of geography and cartography. And I took a class with them on the sort of theory of space and how it intersects with historical research. And I just became really fascinated with trying to make sense and understand space. I knew that I wanted to be a Southern historian, and I was from the Deep South, from Alabama, and I knew that I wanted to study the history of slavery. And so I started to try and make sense of how I could use those ideas that I'd learned from Tung Chai and an understanding of slavery in the South. And so initially, my project was to try to understand or make sense of how the enslaved imagined space. And through that, it was possible for me, I thought, to think about how they produced space and in that way, understand how they asserted power in the antebellum and early national South, as well as how that power shaped the South as it came to be, if that makes any sense. And so, I mostly was interested in looking at plantation spaces. I was mostly interested in looking at movement and running away. And I was really interested in trying to get a sense of how historians of the diaspora were coming to understand how the enslaved understood space. And so sort of out of all of that reading and thinking, my initial project was just looking at those spaces. As I developed it and was turning it into the book, I became more interested in this idea of state space or the state in general. And so I started to look beyond the plantation to look at the way that the enslaved 
were building roads, were building canals, how they traveled between spaces. And it was giving me a better sense of the kind of spatial experiences that the enslaved had on a regular basis. Alongside that, I was trying to work through the sort of dense ideas about what space actually is. And so I think, you know, it might be helpful to clarify that I think one way that we think about space is simply as landscape, right? So the sort of lived everyday space that we inhabit. But importantly, the way that sort of theorists approach it is that space is actually the product of social interactions. And I'm leaving a lot out here, but that it's how we perceive and experience space has as much to do with the physical landscape and the way that we've shaped it as much as is how we interpret it and think about it, describe it, and define it in a way. And so, as I started to think about that, it became more clear to me that what I wanted to try and understand was how the enslaved participated in that process. And so, you know, I started to try and understand the ways that we could see the enslaved participating in that social production of space. And so, in my book, I look at the way that slaves produced space in four really distinct ways. The first is the really obvious way that I think people would assume, which is as laborers, right? One of my favorite lines of any books is a line by Ira Berlin, where he said, slaves worked. And I think that that is you know, one of the most important things to keep in front of us is that a lot of what the enslaved in South Carolina are doing to produce spaces that they're actually physically laboring. They're building the roads. They're digging the land that becomes the canals and the cuts. You know, they're maintaining the infrastructure. They're building state buildings. They're doing all of this, the labor. But another important aspect of the production of space is producing the knowledge of space. Like, how do we think about space? How do we organize it in our minds? So, another way that I argue that slaves produce the state and state space is as the objects of informational transactions between planters and sort of state bureaucrats or leaders, if you will. These informational transactions create a kind of knowledge base that allow state leaders and others to imagine the state into being, right? So, you have to be able to conceptualize the tools that one would use to produce something like the state. Another way that space is produced, and the state as well, is through these everyday social interactions, through everyday acts, right? And so, another way that I say that the enslaved produce both space and the state is through their everyday laboring movements, right? So, this is not resistant movement, but instead it's movement oriented toward the maintenance of the plantation enterprise as well as the everyday functioning of the state. So, for example, state leaders would imagine that a road has an economic function allowing goods to be moved from plantation to port for shipment. That movement, particularly in the late colonial and early national eras, and really in particular in the low country, where the enslaved make up such a vast proportion of the population, is primarily done by the enslaved. So, Enslaved boatmen and other workers on boats, enslaved draymen are transporting goods back and forth. And it's that movement which gives those roads, the canals, the ports their meaning, right? It allows the infrastructure to be more than just a built environment. It sort of imposes a very specific meaning on it. Finally, I argue because slaves, of course, were not simply doing the work of their owners or the state. They weren't simply, as I state, the technologies of this kind of development. They also are using this space to their own end, right? And so, as I try to make clear, they're using the space to create and maintain community for spiritual practices, for economic practices, for survival, for a host of different reasons. Those actions have as much of an impact in shaping South Carolina as a modern state and directly shape the way that space sort of emerges in the early 19th century. Wow. Space sounds like it was definitely a lot more than just being a landscape or a room or a place that we're just in. Now, as a historian who studies space, 
How do you determine how people thought about and conceived of space? So what types of historical sources did you consult to uncover the relationship between state making and slavery in South Carolina? Right. So I use the same kinds of sources that everyone is using to study slavery in South Carolina and to study politics in South Carolina. I was looking at a lot of government documents. I was looking at a lot of plantation diaries and records, a lot of newspaper reports. What I was really looking for was evidence often of movement or of description of spaces, right? And so when you have something like, and I use this diary quite a bit, Charles Drayton's diary. Charles Drayton was a planter who owned several plantations and was part of the sort of really important Drayton family in South Carolina. And Drayton Hall, which is still a plantation that people can go and visit, was his country home on the Ashley River. And so Drayton's diary is almost entirely descriptions of his slaves moving from one place to another. It's a little overwhelming how concerned he is with their movement. But what became clear was that movement was or sat at the center of the proper functioning of his plantation enterprise. And you see that in other plantation diaries as well. Henry Lawrence, who also owns sort of widespread plantations and is constantly describing the movement of his slaves. So those were places where I could see the evidence of slaves moving. The objects of informational transactions, you know, we don't have tons of great records about this. But for example, roads in South Carolina are developed as they were through much of the British colonial world through the labor of residents who resided near roads. And that labor was organized through small administrative bodies that acted initially through sort of parish divisions and then eventually district divisions and county divisions as the state's political apparatus developed. These are small bodies, usually of wealthy planters who reside within the vicinity of a road. In the low country particularly, but across South Carolina, the responsibility of road building was it's the responsibility of all men who reside within a particular distance from the road. In the low country, that ended up being primarily African-American men and African men. And in order for the road commissioners, as they were known, to be able to properly deploy labor and assess it, they had to receive information from planters about the number of male slaves working on a plantation, so forth and so on, right? So we have some of those records still from some of the parishes. So you can see how they gather that information. You can see some of the returns, which would just be planters relaying the number of enslaved people they have. We can see the kinds of road work that they're doing. I also relied really heavily on petitions to the state government because whilst lots of people are claiming to do the work of the early state as part of their public responsibility, they're often doing it because they expect to get something in return. And when they don't get something in return, they often petition the state government for recompense. That's particularly the case when the individuals that they provided for state labor died. And so they were expecting to receive some kind of compensation for those deaths. And so those kinds of sources revealed quite a bit to me about the kinds of work that slaves were doing, where they were doing the work that they were doing like what that work looked like on an everyday basis and the way the state perceived it. So, you know, in a lot of ways, sort of typical sources, but I was looking for something really different. And then, of course, I'm obsessed with the history of cartography just as a sort of hobby. And also because I think it's just a really interesting scholarly sort of focus. And so I often use these really great collections of maps of South Carolina that existed from the middle of the 18th century on through the beginning of the 19th century. Now, Black Carolinians' involvement in building the state of South Carolina took place even before South Carolina had secured its independence from Great Britain. Ryan, would you tell us how Black Carolinians supported the American side during the American Revolution and in the ways they contributed to the American victory and to securing South Carolina's statehood? I think there are really two ways to think about this question. One which might seem sort of counter to the question, but one that kind of answers directly what you're asking. So the first way I think is that the 
enslaved and slavery as a sort of institution were really central to the folks who became Whigs, the folks who supported the American Revolution in South Carolina. Wealthy planters often joined the cause because they were concerned with maintaining the institution of slavery. And so, arguably, one of the ways that the enslaved sort of support the American Revolution, I'm using scare quotes that you can't see, is that they are central to a substantial number of South Carolinians joining that cause in the first place, right? And they do that not just as sort of this disembodied, abstract institution of slavery, but also through their actions. So, one of the first activities in the Revolutionary War was actually the removal of runaway slaves who were attempting to join up with the British from Sullivan's Island, which will be where Fort Moultrie would be built. So, this was a really strategically important island at the entrance to the harbor. And pretty shortly after the British sort of stationed a ship off the coast, enslaved men and women ran away to the island in the hopes to join the British military. And so, one of the first military actions you see is actually South Carolina forces violently taking back that island. So, I think one way that we can see the sort of central role of the enslaved is that they're not just a sort of ideological foil that South Carolinians are fairly obsessed with, but they're also sort of forcing them to make decisions and form military bodies and to act in a way. So, that's one side, right? And there's a lot we could say to that, right? There's lots of ways that the British, through the Somerset case, for example, or Lord Dunmore's proclamation in Virginia, sort of inspired wealthy South Carolinians to push back against parliamentary claims to power, so forth and so on. I think when we're thinking about like the how does the labor of the enslaved help the rebel side when there's lots of different ways we can see that. So, you know, I think the South Carolina flag, the state flag, which is a sort of crescent moon on a blue standard with a palmetto tree in the middle. So, that flag was initially Moultrie's battle flag, and it was just the blue standard with the crescent moon. And it was after the repelling of the British as they bombarded Sullivan's Island in their first attempt to take Charleston that they added the palmetto tree because the fort had been built out of palmetto logs, which are very spongy. And so they absorbed the cannon shot and sort of were central to the South Carolina victory. That's kind of South Carolina lore. What I was really interested in knowing and what I just imagined and then found in my research was, well, who built that fort? Who cut down the palmetto logs that were so important? Who transported those palmetto logs to the island? And then who put them up? And so there's lots of evidence for that kind of labor happening. I think historians know that, and we've often sort of alluded to it, but we don't stop and think about what that means, I think, for how the revolutionary state or rebel state comes into being and survives. Nor do we often remember that it's that labor is sort of constantly memorialized in the South Carolina state flag, but it's really unspoken. It goes unnoticed. So, I think a lot of that kind of labor, they're building the forts. And there are other ways as well, which I'm happy to go into. At the start of that bit of conversation, you mentioned the Somerset case and Dunmore's proclamation. Would you just give us a brief idea of what those occurrences were? The Somerset case was a case in Britain decided by Lord Mansfeld where the British, and I'm just going to give you the very brief version of this, decide that slavery is a local issue. And so, effectively, they're deciding the case of an individual who was enslaved in Boston and Virginia and then goes to London with their owner. And the early abolitionists are sort of pushing for that person's status to not exist in England because there are no laws about slavery in England. And Mansfield decides that that's true, right? That had the person remained in places where slavery was legal, then he would have remained a slave. But as they were in Britain, that status no longer existed. So, that was really a sort of initial legal challenge to the institution of slavery that was felt across the British colonies. And it should be important to note that while we're mostly concerned in the United States about 13 of the colonies, there are, of course, 26 colonies that the British have in what we effectively know as North America all of which had slavery as an institution, some of which, like South Carolina, Georgia, 
and Virginia, but of course in the Caribbean have many more slaves, right? And so this is a really important case in terms of how those individual slave owners are perceiving the relationship between the British government and the colonies. And so that case troubles South Carolinian slave owners as it does Virginians and Georgians, as well as Jamaicans and Barbadians. Lord Dunmore's proclamation was an attempt by Virginia's royal governor to sort of sway Virginia's planters by suggesting that if the enslaved and other folks who were held in captivity would fight for the British, then they would win their freedom. This sort of sparks a lot of fear amongst slaveholders in southern colonies who had also been hearing rumors, and this is particularly true in South Carolina, that the British intended to foment rebellion amongst the enslaved population as well as Native Americans. And so, you know, there's this sense that the British government is working against colonists and it sort of effectively propels some people toward the rebel side. It's important to note, of course, that in South Carolina, especially, but across North America, the revolution is, as I'm sure some of your other guests have noted, it's effectively a civil war in a lot of ways. I mean, there are a substantial number of loyalists in South Carolina, as there are a substantial number of people who aren't choosing to fight for either side, but who are getting caught up in the war itself. Now, one aspect of making a slave state that really surprised me was just how often South Carolina's revolutionary government called upon enslaved labor to build fortifications like Fort Moultrie and to build other infrastructure it needed to carry out the war. Ryan, after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I'd like for you to tell us a bit more about where the South Carolina government got the idea to call upon enslaved labor to build its infrastructure and how they went about calling upon that labor. This episode was made possible by the Omohundro Institute, proud publishers of award-winning books since 1943, and now the publishers of acclaimed digital scholarship, too. So what is this digital scholarship? Like the OI's books in the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history and culture published by the Omohundro Institute, digital scholarship is first and foremost scholarship. It's historical research that has withstood rigorous peer review, or that feedback that scholars receive from other scholars, and scholarship that has met the highest standards for editing. But unlike traditional books or William Mary Quarterly journal articles, digital scholarship is published in a digital format, in this case, within the OI's own app, the OI Reader. And Ben Franklin's World listeners can explore this great digital scholarship for free. Just download the free OI Reader app onto your favorite smartphone or tablet device. And when you open the app, look for OpenWMQ. Within the OpenWMQ selections, you'll find a wealth of resources, including resources for the Doing History series, as well as a new digital selection called Hidden in Plain Sight by Simon Newman, our guest historian from episode 66. Now, Simon's article brings late 18th and 19th century Jamaica to life through images, interactive maps, and sound. This digital article takes you along the journeys of the men and women who escaped slavery by traveling treacherous countryside trails and then by hiding in plain sight in the busy marketplaces and towns of the day. And now you can embark on this journey for free. Just download the OI Reader from your favorite app store and explore Simon's new digital article for yourself. And once you do, you'll see why, even after more than 75 years, the Omohundro Institute is still the leading institute of early American history and culture. Ryan, I was really surprised by how often South Carolina seemed to call upon enslaved labor during the revolution. So would you tell us where the state got the idea to use enslaved labor to build the infrastructure of war and how exactly it called upon this labor? I asked this last part because enslaved labor was a form of private property during this period. So it kind of sounds like to me like the state may have infringed on private property rights. Well, I mean, this is a way that the state, I think, really comes into being as a consequence of fulfilling this demand for labor. So it's asserting powers that are seemingly new, but of course, it has a tradition from the colonial era as well. And so, as I noted a little bit earlier, the state and parishes relied upon enslaved labor to construct roads and bridges and canals. And they would frequently call upon that labor. 
they were doing that in a limited capacity. It was twice a year that you were required to work on roads and at other times when necessary. But there had been other times in South Carolina's history when military exigency had led South Carolina's colonial government to call upon planters to either lend their slaves labor, like they just take it or they pay for it, right? So there's this longer tradition during the Seven Years' War and earlier conflicts where South Carolina's government and really the British government are calling upon planters to provide that labor to build things like fortifications, to travel with soldiers to Georgia, for example, when the Spanish are threatening to attack. And this creates this sort of understanding amongst South Carolina's rebellious leadership that this is a labor force that they can regularly call upon. You see this linger through, of course, the antebellum period, and Stephanie McCurry does a really fantastic job of arguing this in Confederate Reckoning, that when seceding states left the Union and create the Confederate nation, one of the immediate assumptions they have is that the enslaved will be a laboring force that supports the army, that builds the infrastructure, that maintains their economy, right? There's this sort of presumption that however individual owners want to deploy, the state just has to call upon that labor at any time, right? And it's the responsibility of citizens. And this idea sort of develops more over the 19th century to provide that labor when called upon. And so there are forceful acts that they pass to compel people to provide their labor. They do promise compensation at times, but if people have not signed the loyalty oath, the state, at least in the legislation that provides them the right to take this labor or to use this labor, the legislation suggests that they will simply take that labor from owners if they have not signed the loyalty oath, right? So there would be no compensation involved. South Carolina's use of enslaved labor during the revolution seemed to set a pretty important precedent because after the war, the state of South Carolina would call upon this labor again. Now, before we get into how South Carolina called upon this labor, would you tell us something about the state of South Carolina after the war for independence? I mean, what kind of condition was the state in after the war ravaged right through its territory during its latter years? I think there's you know a lot of ways to think about this because I think the physical landscape itself has been deeply affected, right? I mean, South Carolina is you know a very important theater in the Revolutionary War. A lot of fighting happens across the entirety of the state. Charleston is under British control, and the Low Country plantations are being heavily disrupted. And there's a lot of fighting in the Piedmont as well as in the upcountry as well, sort of the mountainous region and the region around today, Camden and Columbia. And so that amount of fighting is very disruptive in a lot of different ways. I mean, it's affecting the landscape, but mostly in pockets where fighting actually happens. But what it's really doing, I think, in terms of the physical landscape is it's interrupting the maintenance that's required for the sort of upkeep of a landscape like this. And every year, as I've noted, folks are called out to maintain the roads because, as you might imagine, with heavy rains or with inclement weather of any kind, what effectively are dirt roads easily get disrupted. Moreover, with any kind of heavy traffic with wagon wheels or horses, those roads get severely sort of undermined in a way. Importantly as well, the landscape of plantation agriculture is heavily disrupted. Rice planting, whether it be tidal rice planting or inland swamp rice planting, requires a significant amount of daily upkeep to maintain the infrastructure of those working plantations. Without that kind of daily upkeep, they fall into disrepair. And so it takes a significant amount of labor to build those plantations up. At the end of the war, what you end up having is a significant number of plantation owners who either leave because they're loyalists, they've been ruined by the war in some other way, or they decide to move on to different spaces. So you see places like St. Stephen's Parish, which had previously been the sort of center of inland rice production, and people kind of turn away from it. Some of them are turning toward tidal rice production. Some of them are moving to the backcountry to begin, you know, sort of moving toward other kinds of agricultural production. And eventually, you know, you see more and more people leaving for Georgia and other places. So there's still plantation 
development happening in South Carolina, but it's severely disrupted by the revolution. And it really never goes back to its wild success that it has in the pre-revolutionary era. Now, it wasn't just South Carolina's roads that needed to be rebuilt after the war. South Carolina also had to rebuild and reshape its identity as a Republican state. So, Ryan, how did South Carolinians envision their state after the war? And how did they intend to rebuild their state, its economy and all of its infrastructure? So I think from my perspective, what I'm really interested in is how they are beginning to think of South Carolina as this bound together space. Right. So I think when people think about space and the state, I mean, one of the ways that we often think about them is how we know territory, right, is this bounded space within which the actions of the state occur, if that makes sense. And so South Carolinians are thinking about this prior to the revolution, particularly during the regulator movement, right, this sort of series of small rebellions and resistances from backcountry residents who are demanding a larger state or governing presence on one hand and pushing back against that presence on the other. So on the eve of the revolution, South Carolinians are contemplating how this space both is bound and how they're going to make those connections. In other words, how do you connect folks who are living in Camden to folks who are living in Charleston, right? How do you make those economic connections? And so they'd begun to imagine it in a variety of ways. I mentioned in the book, cartographers are producing maps of South Carolina that are sort of illuminating this bounded space as an entirety. They're acquiring new space from the Cherokee, both through fighting and then treaties in the aftermath. And so they're beginning to sort of make those connections. And so part of what they're doing is fulfilling some of those ideas in the aftermath of the war. And that's through the construction of canals, and in particular, the Santee Cooper Canal, which at the time is the longest canal in the United States. And they imagine a series of other canals that for a variety of reasons don't really come to fruition. They also contemplate rebuilding roads, trying to imagine new ways of deploying labor for better management of those roads, right? So in a lot of ways, they're connecting the state. One clear way that you can see the state moving away from its sort of coastal origins and becoming instead this sort of bounded whole that we recognize today is through the creation of Columbia as the capital of South Carolina, right? It's placing the center of government in a more central location that more people will be able to access. It takes the trouble of creating new political divisions like counties where there had previously only been districts that were quite large. So these are more manageable governing spaces, right? So it's connecting residents of South Carolina economically. It's dividing the space up into more knowable political divisions, and it's moving the capital to Columbia. And all of that work requires a significant amount of physical labor simply to build those spaces, to build the canals, to build a new state capital where effectively it had just been sort of a stopover. And often they relied upon the labor of the enslaved to do so. Did the state acquire the labor of enslaved people for all of these different projects much the same way that they'd acquired it during the revolution? Or because South Carolina after the war was now an early republic in peacetime space, Did the state adopt new methods for obtaining enslaved labor? So initially, right after the war, during the war, you see General Thomas Sumter, one of South Carolina's generals. One of the main ways that slaves support the Revolutionary War is that they're the promised payment of folks who volunteer to fight for South Carolina. That's a troubling thought for a number of reasons. But the way they acquire them initially, Thomas Sumter and his troops would just take them from people who they claimed were loyalist and just remove them from the plantation and then distribute them amongst the troops and the officers. So that's kind of illegal. It doesn't really have the right to do that, but the state legalizes it shortly thereafter. So South Carolina's rebellious leadership passes a law that basically says the same thing, that people who join the South Carolina military toward the end of the war will be awarded slaves for payment. That was just partially because, obviously, they don't really have any money, and they don't really have any money anyone will trust. 
and land is being distributed as well as reward. But I think for a lot of South Carolinians, the most stable sort of transactional piece of property is the enslaved. And so part of the way that they plan on acquiring those slaves is through confiscation. So as a way to punish loyalist South Carolinians, South Carolina passes a law that people's property, including slaves, will be confiscated. Now, for a number of reasons, this doesn't play out the way that South Carolina's government initially imagines it, but they do acquire slaves in this way and they sell them to individual people. They also distribute them to people in the military as well as to help folks in the continued fight against the British toward the end of the war. And so, Initially, they are envisioning a similar kind of process that through confiscation, the state will have acquired a substantial number of slaves and that they will be distributed amongst the various sort of projects that they have underway. They just don't acquire enough to make that happen. And so what ends up happening is that it varies depending upon the project. Sometimes contractors have their own enslaved labor force. So the individual who constructs the state capital has his own enslaved labor force. And whenever his creditors take those slaves away from him for his debt, he's unable to complete the state capital in the time that they've allotted for him. For the Santee Cooper Canal, you have a private company. So effectively like a very early corporation who are granted the right. And this is in the midst of a prohibition on slave importation that South Carolina had implemented in the aftermath of the war, they're given leeway to purchase 300 individuals from the African slave trade. So that's one way they acquire slaves. Another way is that they're paying individuals for their slaves' labor. So they'll basically purchase the labor of the slave themselves for a year at a time or longer if the owner is willing. You know, now that we have an idea of the different types of state spaces that we'd find in South Carolina and the types of spaces that South Carolinians hope to build, I really think we should dive into the experiences of the enslaved laborers. In Making a Slave State, Ryan discusses how enslaved laborers use state work as opportunities to expand both their knowledge of the state's geography and to expand their networks and communities of people. Ryan, How did enslaved men and women use state projects to increase their knowledge of South Carolina and its people? And how did they use all of their newfound knowledge and connections once they had them? Yeah. So there are several things that happen during these sort of explicitly state-oriented projects, right? And so one thing that happens is they're just acquiring a knowledge of the landscape away from the plantation, right? And so I should say that the bulk of laborers who are called upon to work on fortifications and roads are more often than not enslaved men. For some projects like the Santee Cooper Canal, enslaved women are part of the labor force, but by and large, the laboring force for state projects, even if they're under private sort of development, are enslaved men. So just to sort of clarify that. You know, in these moments, they're learning about the physical landscape, about places, about where the roads go, about who lives on these roads, what businesses are on the roads, where they might hide, things like that. But they're also gathering together as large groups. Under observation, there are usually white overseers who are at these projects as well, but very few. And so they're meeting people from other plantations. They're learning more about those plantations. They're effectively given the opportunity, I don't know if this is the way white Carolinians envision it, but they're creating community in these moments. And so that community becomes important for a variety of reasons. I think, importantly, they create economic connections for a sort of illicit marketplace that allows for enslaved survival. Importantly, they learn about religious practices, cultural practices, But they also are able to, I think, importantly, develop ideas about resisting the institution of slavery. And the most important one of these is the Stonehill Rebellion in 1739. Now, this is a well-known slave rebellion. It's the largest in South Carolina's history. And while there's some discussion about its origins, one of the things that Lieutenant Governor William Bull remembers later on, because his father encountered the enslaved rebellion as it was occurring, is that the initial rebellion starts because of slaves who had gathered to do road work. 
And so they're given an opportunity because there's less observation to contemplate these kinds of acts. Okay, so road and state infrastructure work could facilitate the creation of connections that enslaved people might use to resist slavery. And one of the ways, of course, that enslaved people often resisted slavery was just to run away. So, Ryan, Joanne would like to know more about maroon communities. So would you tell us about the act of running away, about maroons and their communities, and where in South Carolina maroons form their communities? If your listeners are familiar with South Carolina, particularly the low country, they know that it's a swampy landscape. And I think when you hear that, it's easy to imagine something. But to actually sort of go into these spaces, even today with as much development as there is in coastal South Carolina, see how dense these spaces are, how easy it would be to sort of find hidden spaces to reside. And so runaway slaves in the late 18th and early 19th century, and really throughout the 18th century, are aware of these spaces as well, and not as often as they do in places like Jamaica or Suriname. They don't create the same kind of permanent communities that get created in a Jamaica or Suriname, but they create communities of runaways in a variety of places throughout South Carolina, often nearby large plantations, primarily because those plantations are resources that these communities use. But you see them in places like the Savannah River area. You see them in places like the swamps that are sort of directly west of Charleston. You see them in the inland waterways amongst the swamps sort of southwest of Charleston as well. So there's a substantial number of enslaved people in the low country of South Carolina. I mean, some estimates would put the number at about 90% of the low country's population is enslaved. That's a lot of knowledge and that's a lot of opportunity to create these spaces. Now, it should be noted that you know, there's sort of the violent oversight and maintenance of the institution. So these sites are purposefully hidden. They're not well known and often they're not long lasting on purpose because they needed to be able to defy the folks who would try to undermine them. And so you see, I think in the book, I talk about the Savannah River Maroons, which is a maroon community that emerges really during the Revolutionary War. And it's not really discovered by Georgia officials until after the Revolutionary War. And then it takes a concerted effort, both by the South Carolina militia, the Georgia militia, as well as Catawba, Native American community that were frequently used by South Carolina's government to find runaway slaves and to capture or kill them. Now, in making a slave state, Ryan contends that Black Carolinians not only built South Carolina's state infrastructure and spaces, They also made those spaces and infrastructure their own. Ryan, would you tell us about how and why Black Carolinians were able to make South Carolina's infrastructure and spaces their own? The why, I think, is just everyday life, right? I mean, I think it's about survival. I think it's about community building. You know, I hesitate to try and put words in anyone's mouth. I think we can sort of imagine a variety of reasons why people would do any number of things. And I think what's really important is that often when we think about why slaves use or enslaved people use particular spaces, so they run away from plantation labor, so forth and so on, what we tend to imagine is that that is a reaction to the oppressiveness of the institution of slavery. And that's absolutely true, right? I mean, that is a significant part of why enslaved men, women, and children do any number of things. But it's not the only reason why they do the things that they do. Sometimes they're participating in economic activity. Sometimes they're participating in cultural activity. Sometimes they're maintaining social networks. And I think it's really important that we try to, as historians, envision and find all of those reasons, not exclusively resistance to white supremacy or the institution of slavery. So how they do it is through, I think, their everyday laboring practices. They find these spaces, they create these networks, they create these communities. And then either during their laboring activities or in times that they have for themselves, or as they run away, they go back to these places. And what was really interesting was the number of times that I kept seeing how runaway enslaved men and women would 
go back to the communities that they'd been sold away from or that they'd been moved away from, right? So I think when I initially started working on this, I sort of had an assumption that I think a lot of people have, which is that when people run away, they run away to freedom, right? And I think what I came to understand is they're not running away to freedom, which is this really kind of ephemeral idea. And it's where or what is that at the beginning of the 19th century? Instead, what I found was that they were often running away to places they knew, the plantations that they had used to work on. Charleston Neck, where Black South Carolinians create sort of a thriving community. It's often overwhelmed and undermined by officials in South Carolina, but you regularly see Charleston Neck as an important site to the sites where they are selling goods for their owners. They would return to those sites for their own transactional purposes and alongside the edges of plantations where they knew they would encounter dozens, if not at times, hundreds of people who wanted to purchase things, communicate with one another, or share in religious or spiritual practices. And that's kind of one of the ironies, right? That South Carolina used enslaved labor to build its infrastructure and spaces in the hopes that white South Carolinians would be able to increase their movement and trade along this infrastructure. But what really seems to have happened is that Black Carolinians were the ones who had increased movement. So why did enslaved people really need to move about the state? And did South Carolina ever attempt to regulate their movement? I mean, it really couldn't have been a secret that Black Carolinians were using all these roads and canals to move around the state. One of the things that I think is really important in understanding the institution of slavery, it changes dramatically over time, whether that's the consequence of the Revolutionary War or the consequence of the geographic expansion of the United States or the development of new plantation agricultural products. And in South Carolina, it changes throughout the 18th and into the 19th century as the plantation enterprise is expanding dramatically particularly in the middle of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. So part of the reason they're moving substantially is because they're building that plantation enterprise. And one of the things that is really clear is that in South Carolina, where you have some of the wealthiest plantation owners in all of North America, you often have people like Charles Drayton and Henry Lawrence who own more than one plantation. And I think one of the things we imagine is that at each of those plantations, those owners are simply just finding and buying and placing a labor force. But what they're actually doing is that they're often sharing that labor force across their various plantations. And so often laborers are moving from one plantation to another, depending on what's being grown, depending on labor needs. You also have a group of folks who are skilled slaves who are moving between the entire plantation network of their owner and sometimes their labor is being lent out to upkeep these sites. So whether those be carpenters or blacksmiths, they're moving where their labor is needed. You also, because this plantation enterprise is so dispersed, and even when folks own just a single plantation, they don't often reside on that plantation, the owners. And so information itself has to move between plantations and wherever the owner or the manager of that plantation may be. So there are individuals who are traveling to share that information. You also have enslaved midwives who are traveling for births across their communities. And one of the groups that is constantly on the move that's facilitating all of this mobility that sits at the center of so much of what I think is the plantation enterprise at the beginning of the 19th century, at least in the sort of older settled plantation regions, are enslaved boatmen. It is illegal for enslaved men to operate on a boat without white observation, but a lot of South Carolinians just ignore that rule altogether. And so you often have a sort of traveling labor force that are transporting goods, information, they're bringing materials that are needed at plantations, back to plantations, they're taking commodities to Charleston to be shipped out, right? So there's just this kind of constant movement that's going on as the plantation enterprise is developing, but then also to maintain the plantation enterprise. So there's a, you know, I think just in the everyday act of keeping South Carolina going, there's a substantial amount of mobility 
And we often overlook that mobility because I think when we imagine slavery, we often imagine that labor happening on a plantation where absolutely the bulk of people reside and they're strictly confined to those spaces. But there's also a lot of movement. And so the state has to develop a means by which they can facilitate that movement. So I think when we think about slave passes and we often think about those passes as a way to constrain the movement of the enslaved, and that's absolutely true. I mean, a significant part of what, you know, I think plantation owners as well as state leaders imagine when they imagine slave passes is really confining the movement of the enslaved. But how do you both confine movement and allow for the necessary mobility that is required by such a rapidly developing plantation enterprise? And so the slave passes are as much about confining people as allowing that movement to occur throughout South Carolina. So these slave passes, we imagine them to say, and they do certainly develop later in this way in other parts of the American South, we imagine them to say exactly where someone is going and for how long. But as I saw repeatedly, slave passes often just are granting permission for an individual to be away from the plantation with no strict limits on where they're going or how long they'll be gone. It's really, in a way, a notification of an owner's claim on that person and the extended rights of that claim beyond the boundaries of the plantation as much as it is about confining the movement of the enslaved. Now, before we jump into the time warp, why do you think it's important that we understand how enslaved people made the state in South Carolina? I mean, how does this knowledge really change what we think we know about slavery and the early American past? I mean, it's a really good question. I think that there are a few reasons why I think this is really important. First, it helps us reimagine what we mean when we say the state. I mean, this is really one of the big goals that I had with this project was trying to understand what exactly we mean when we say the state. And I think what we often do is conflate the state with governing bodies, legislatures, courts, the executive branch. But the state is actually, you know, as some people would argue, a consequence of everyday activities. It's much bigger than just sort of these governing entities. And so, in a way, what I wanted to try and illuminate was how the state is bigger than that, right? It's how it emerges and develops, not simply because of decisions that are made in Columbia or more broadly in Washington, D.C. or in London, but instead how it develops on the ground through people's everyday actions. And as importantly as I wanted to illuminate this more sort of capacious view of what the state actually is, I also wanted to try and illuminate how individuals who are often perceived as outside of the state, right? So, the enslaved, impossible citizens, impossible subjects is how they're perceived. And yet, they sit at the center of the production of the state. And in this way, I wanted to reimagine how we think of political activity, how we think about who is participating in the production of the state and what that means for how we come to understand the state, not just in the distant past, but I think also in our everyday lives. Let's jump into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Great Britain had maintained possession and governance of its 13 rebellious North American colonies? If South Carolina had remained British, what would the role of enslaved people have been in building a British South Carolinian colony? I think it's a really interesting question. I think that we have some answers to that question because we can look to the fate of the other six slaveholding Caribbean colonies that remain part of British North America following the revolution, right? So, in a way, we kind of can see perhaps one outcome, which occurs in places like Jamaica, where, you know, I think folks like Trevor Bernard or Andrew O'Shaughnessy, they've done some really interesting work about this recently and trying to imagine what happens after the revolution to slavery as an institution 
in the remaining British colonies, right? We begin to see a more active role by the British imperial government in terms of the institution and its colonies. And of course, eventually we'll see the sort of success of the abolitionist movement with emancipation. So one way of perceiving the American Revolution is that South Carolinians and Georgians and other slaveholding plantation owning revolutionaries, in a way, solidify their hold on the institution. They sort of secure it in a way that we kind of can clearly see doesn't happen in a place like Jamaica, right? I mean, with emancipation. So it's hard to say, would the enslaved be part of building up this sort of British empire state? I think they certainly would participate. They obviously are in the Caribbean. I think what's really interesting is to think about how the freedmen and women build up these places and these states following emancipation in the broader British Empire. You know, I would imagine that something like that would also happen in North America as well. But of course, it's impossible to know. So what is your next project about? Are you still exploring ideas about space? I'm actually really interested in still considering how the enslaved are shaping state practices. But I want to try and move to a sort of larger stage than just South Carolina. And I'm really interested in the way that the sort of activities of the enslaved shape emancipation as it emerges in the British Empire. So, for example, I'm really interested right now, and I'm doing a lot of research on compensated emancipation in the UK or in Britain, where, of course, the sort of British state compensates all of its slave owners following emancipation. So I think this has a longer history of the state compensating slave owners for what they perceive to be as the state's interest or what they say in the United States as the public good. And so right now I'm sort of investigating and doing research on compensation in all its forms across the British Empire. So from compensated claims for slave deaths. So there's moments in like Antigua where they think a rebellion is going to happen and the sort of provincial leaders execute the supposed ringleaders and they're compensated. And so I'm trying to figure out how that's connected to the later emancipated or compensated emancipation. So really still how slaves are shaping the state. Now, how can we get in touch with you if we have questions about the ways that enslaved people made the state of South Carolina? Right. So you could look me up on Wellesley College's History Department website. My email address is there. It's R Quintan, so my last name without the A at the end at wellesley.edu. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Ryan Katana, thank you for helping us expand our ideas about space and about how enslaved people helped to build those spaces in early America. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. We often equate the state with governing bodies, but it's also much larger than governing bodies. What we know is the state ultimately emerges from the everyday activities of its people. And as Ryan noted, Many of those everyday activities took place in state spaces, such as along roads and canals, or in a broader sense, within the boundary lines of a specific state, like South Carolina. So there's really a micro and a macro level to both the state and its space. Now, what's really interesting for us to consider about Ryan's study is how exploring concepts such as the state and state spaces allows us to see more about the everyday lives and activities of enslaved people. People who legally stood outside of the state, and yet, as Ryan revealed, also stood at the very center of the state. Enslaved men and women built the state of South Carolina. They built its roads and canals. They built its state capital at Columbia. They also helped to build its economy by conveying information from plantation to plantation and community to community, and by bringing plantation and backcountry goods to coastal markets. In essence, enslaved people produced the state and its spaces through their everyday work and interactions. And lastly, I also think it's important for us to consider that brief point that Ryan made about how the institution of slavery has changed over time. The revolution, the production of new agricultural produce, and the geographic expansion of the United States all caused slaveholders to make adjustments into how they practiced and enforced slavery. And we heard about one of these adjustments when Ryan told us about travel passes. South Carolina needed to both facilitate and restrict the movement of its enslaved people. So it passed laws that made it necessary for slaveholders to state 
where, when, and for how long they permitted their enslaved people to travel. Of course, as with many endeavors of the state, there was a difference between the way the government intended for slave passes to work and the way they actually worked. For example, slaveholders often granted travel passes without stating the state's required restrictions on them. Look for more information about Ryan, his book, Making a Slave State, plus notes for what we talked about today on the show notes page benfranklinsworld.com slash 226. The Omohundro Institute has published the leading journal of early American history and culture and award-winning books since 1943. And now it's publishing a clean digital scholarship like Simon Newman's Hidden in Plain Sight. To explore Simon's interactive article about how enslaved people escaped from slavery in 18th century Jamaica, as well as other great digital resources, download the free OI Reader app from your favorite app store and browse all the open WMQ and Doing History selections. Again, to access these great resources, download the OI Reader app from your favorite app store. Finally, does thinking about space as a product of everyday actions and interactions change the way that you think about it? I'd love to know because it's really a big idea. So please send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.